order, questions to the Secretary of State for Scotland, Mr Brendan O'Hara. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, I will answer questions one, three, six, nine, twelve and thirteen. The EU Withdrawal Act confirmed that where EU law intersects with devolved competence, those powers will flow directly to the devolved administrations on exit day. This means that over 100 powers will go directly to the Scottish Parliament. We are also continuing to make progress to establish common frameworks which the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations discussed last week. Brendan O'Hara. Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State is turning a blind eye to the depopulation crisis facing rural Scotland. His Government's refusal to even consider devolving immigration powers to the Scottish Parliament will cause further damage to these fragile communities. Will he explain to, to people and businesses in my constituency how the ending of freedom of movement will help solve this depopulation crisis? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, on the first issue, the Smith Commission, uh, was, which was supported at that time by the SNP, uh, determined that immigration would not uh, be devolved uh, to the Scottish uh, Parliament. I am acutely aware of issues uh, surrounding uh, depopulation and demographic challenges, and indeed I heard them directly in his own constituency. Migration is one part of the issue, but as I heard in his own constituency, issues like transport and housing are another part of it. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is it not in fact the case that by reappropriating powers to this Parliament without them going to Holyrood, he's the Secretary of State presiding over the biggest power grab since devolution began? Not further devolution. Was his colleague Adam Thompson was his colleague Adam Tompkins correct this morning when he said that the Scottish Tories are unionists first and Conservatives second? They never wanted the Scottish Parliament to succeed and now they're using Brexit to undermine it. What the position is very clearly, Mr Speaker, is that the honourable gentleman and his colleagues want to break up our United Kingdom. I will defend our United Kingdom until my last breath. Mr. Speaker, not only has his government taken the Scottish government to court for trying to protect its own devolved powers, we now hear the Secretary of State saying that any measures offered to Scotland to reflect the overwhelming Remain vote would cause him to consider his own position, a position confirmed this morning by Adam, Tomkin, Adam Tompkins as no idle threat made in the heat of the moment. Uh, is he really surprised, therefore, that the Scottish people see this blatant Tory power grab for what it is, and will they follow through for his threat to go and go now? Yeah. Mr uh, uh, Speaker, I, I, have, I make no apology for making absolutely clear that the integrity of the United Kingdom is a red line for me and my Scottish Conservative colleagues in any deal on leaving the EU. And the position is exactly the same for our Prime Minister. I know uh, that S those on the SNP benches preference would be a Brexit of the most disruptive kind, which, is the, which they see as best able to take forward their cause. Be black. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. The Migration Advisory Committee accepts the dangers to Scotland's labour force and economy under the mm -hmm. current UK system. 64% of Scottish voters now want to see immigration policy devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Given that we have seen the reality of the cruel system that the UK Government have implemented, why not give the Scottish Parliament the right to do things differently? Yeah. Mr Speaker, in my uh, earlier uh, response, I made clear that when these, these matters were uh, considered in depth uh, by the Smith Commission, it was uh, agreed that immigration would not uh, be devolved. And and at, a, at the recent CBI Scotland dinner, which was attended by the First Minister of Scotland, the Director General of the CBI in Scotland made clear that business did not support the devolution of immigration and having a separate immigration policy in Scotland. Steve Blackman. Mr Speaker, if the Secretary of State really believes that he's fighting Scotland's corner, as he said in Holyrood magazine, um, can he tell us why he is currently supporting an agriculture bill that will see powers removed from the Scottish Parliament yeah. and 
simultaneously failing to honour Tory promises made to Scottish farmers on funding. Mr Speaker, obviously the Honourable uh, Lady did not uh, see yesterday's announcement by the Secretary of State from DEFRA that there is going to be a, a review uh, on convergence uh, funding. There are, no, there are no powers on agriculture being removed from the Scottish Parliament, but what there is is a complete and utter lack of policy from the Scottish Government in relation to Scottish agriculture. They have brought forward no proposals for post Brexit agriculture in Scotland. Chris Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the non answers so far, can the Secretary of State tell us if there are any circumstances in which he would support the devolution of powers to protect Scotland's interests after Brexit? Or given his threats to resign, is it not the case that he would rather resign his own position before supporting any measure aimed at ensuring Scotland is protected from a hard right wing Tory Brexit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as far as I'm aware, there's only one party in this Parliament that has so far declared that it will support a no-deal Brexit, and that is the SNP. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon was very clear on my... Order, 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 order. The, order. the Secretary of State has been asked a question. The Right Honourable Gentleman is answering the question. In that context, a lot of finger-pointing is at the very least discourteous to the Secretary of State. Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As you may be aware, Nicola Sturgeon on Monday made clear that she will order SNP MPs in this Parliament to vote for a no-deal Brexit. And what they have to decide between now and then is whether they will blindly follow her through the lobbies or they will truly stand up for Scotland. Bill Grant. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. If I could refer to the fairy tale of a power grab, more than 100 powers which are currently held in Brussels are to be transferred to Holyrood after breakfast. Breakfast? (laughs) After Brexit? (laughs) The sooner the better. Does my right honourable friend agree that far from removing powers from Scotland, leaving the EU will actually give the Scottish Parliament far more power? Mr Speaker, I will certainly use my best endeavours to ensure that those powers are transferred as soon after breakfast on the day we leave the EU as is possible. But my honourable friend is absolutely right. Only the SNP would complain that the Scottish Parliament will have significantly more powers after we leave the EU than it does today. There is an opportunity for the honourable member for from East Renfrewshire to come in on this if he wants, because his question won't be reached. It's up to him. Paul Masterson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The uh, devolution of significant amounts of welfare powers will represent a step change in the maturity of devolution in Scotland. Does he agree with me that in order for this to work for my constituents and his, it's absolutely vital that Scotland's two governments work together properly? Mr Speaker, welfare is an area where there is a very good track record of the two governments uh, working together. We recently met in the Joint Ministerial Group on Welfare, which I uh, co-chair, and we will do so uh, again in the coming weeks. I think what people in Scotland clearly want to see is where the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government are given additional powers, they use those powers. (sighs) David Dukit. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend share my concern that North North East Scotland, the heartland of the UK fishing industry, received just 13% of grants made by the Scottish Government under the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund? Uh, Can he assure me that as we leave the EU, he will work with the Scottish Government to ensure that the fishing communities in the North East get the funding it needs to make the most of the sea of opportunity? I I absolutely share my uh, honourable friend's uh, concern, and as he has, as a champion of the fishing industry, set out many times, of course it is the policy of the SNP Scottish Government to take Scotland right back into the common fisheries policy. It is our policy to leave the common fisheries policy, but also to support the industry to take advantage of that sea of opportunity. Thompson! common fisheries policy. So does my right honourable friend agree with me and the Scottish Fishermen's Federation that Brexit can lead to a fishing boom of up to 2.7 billion to the economy and therefore please share my concern that the Scottish Government's proposal to keep us locked into the CFP with decisions being made in Brussels will betray our fishermen and our coastal communities. 
Mr. S Mr. Uh, Speaker, it's incomprehensible to me and to the nearly half a million SNP voters who voted to leave the EU that the SNP Scottish Government still proposed taking Scotland back into the common fisheries policy. Stephen Kerr. Mr Speaker, will my right honourable friend confirm that one item of potential devolution that the Government will never allow to happen would be to allow the SNP members opposite to drag Scotland out of the UK against the will of the people without even holding another referendum? Mr Speaker, you, you've heard me say many times at this dispatch box that I wanted a second independence referendum taken off the table. What I didn't mean was the Honourable Lady for Edinburgh South West solution that independence could somehow be declared without a referendum. Mrs Henry Trevelyan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Holyrood will gain powers after Brexit in agriculture, but the Scottish Government have decided not to push the schedule into the agriculture bill. This only, isn't only offensive and disrespectful to the Scottish farmers, but my farmers in Northumberland, who have cross-border farms, it will be incredibly difficult for them to bring us. Will the right honourable friend uh, support me in trying to encourage them to actually put a schedule into the bill? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think everybody uh, out with the SNP has agreed that it would be preferable uh, to proceed with such a schedule uh, in the Bill, but Scottish farmers who speak to me they have one clear question. What is the Scottish Government's policy for agriculture post-Brexit? And the answer is, we just don't know. Wish up. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Over the weekend, the Secretary of State threatened to resign and almost typically managed to make a pig's ear out of it. <laughs> Apparently, he was so concerned that Scotland Ramsey might join Northern Ramsey. Ireland in an outcome that would spare us the worst of the Brexit excesses that he would show them and go. Surely, if anything requires his resignation, it's an inability to look after and protect the devolution settlement. Yeah. Mr Speaker, what the Honourable Gentleman and his friends uh, on those benches have to look the people in, of Scotland in the eye and tell them why they are voting for a no-deal Brexit. Day after day, we hear from them how damaging that would be for the economy of Scotland. But on Monday, Nicola Sturgeon ordered the Honourable Gentleman and his colleagues to vote for it. He needs to show some backbone and stand up against her. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, uh, the Smith Commission was signed by all five parties in the Scottish Parliament. So does my right honourable friend believe that instead of debating powers, the SNP should get on and make use of the powers they already have? Mr Speaker, it's quite clear uh, that the people of uh, Scotland want to see uh, the extensive powers that were devolved in the Scotland Act and these powers uh, that, they are, that are coming forward in relation to leaving the EU used. And agriculture, as we've just been discussing, is a very good example. The Scottish Parliament will have uh, these powers, but we have no idea how the Scottish Government will use them. Tommy Shepherd. Uh, Mr Speaker, in his first answer, the Secretary of State referred to progress at the JMC on the common frameworks which will constrain the operation of devolved powers after Brexit. Uh, can he update the House by saying in how many areas frameworks have been agreed, which are they, and by which date does he expect the remainder to be completed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I can advise the Honourable Gentleman, which he will be aware that in uh, the EU Withdrawal uh, Act, the Government is obliged to inform Parliament on those matters and a report will be brought forward in the very near future. Tommy Shepherd. Sounds as if he does not know. The truth is that in only four of the 24 areas have frameworks been agreed and it is now practically impossible for the exercise to be completed by the 29th of March. Given that he, the Secretary of State has threatened to resign, really this is something he should resign over, but if he does not resign, will he give an assurance here today to rule out the use of Section 12 orders to impose frameworks against the consent of the Dole administration? Mr uh, Speaker, I am seeking to be uh, helpful to uh, the Honourable Gentleman and respectful uh, to Parliament, because when the Government is obliged to bring forward a report to Parliament, that is what it wishes to do, in which uh, both his first and second questions will be answered. Leslie Laird. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would just ask for a moment of indulgence.